the car just became a complete monster. I mean, the car was in charge of us. We had no control. I can still feel the, the thud, still feel the feeling of hitting that building sideways. He kept saying, it won't stop, it won't stop, it won't stop. If Ford were aware of all these incidents, I would like to hear Ford's explanation of what has been going on. Bristol, April 1998. Chris Merrick was driving home after work. Suddenly, his car took off with the engine revving loudly. People saw the car hurtling towards a queue of traffic. At the last minute, Chris veered off the road towards a small park called the Garden of Peace. that's where he died. For the last six months, we've been investigating why it happened, because Chris Merrick's death opened up a mystery. Have we been kept in the dark about a major safety problem that may have put thousands of lives at risk? Until this crash, many other people believed they'd been the only ones to battle with a runaway car. It was just my worst fears realised that because I'd had nightmares for so long about what I would have done, I could picture someone else being in that position of driving the car. In March 97, a year before Chris Merrick died, Felicity Beck's family was driving home after a weekend away. It was Gordon, my husband, and Alex, our daughter, who's two, coming up to three at that time, and an older friend of hers, Amy. And it was a real treat for us. It was a three-day break up to Alton Towers. It was a 200-mile drive home to Wiltshire, the first long journey in their new car, which they'd only bought eight days earlier. So we came round here at a normal speed, straight into the outside lane, to overtake the vehicle that was in this slow-moving lane. And I noticed we were still in full acceleration and going extremely fast. What sort of speed? About 70 to 80 miles an hour. Gordon said, but just won't slow down, the brakes aren't working. We approached this roundabout at 70 plus, and the Gordon was frantically trying to brake and also steer the car. Here I said to him, shall I jump out of the car with Alex? Gordon said no, and um, at that point he pulled on the handbrake, did an 180 degree turn with the engine still revving. We just turned around and went up the carriageway the other way. He put the handbrake on again. And the car stalled and we just clambered out. Just in a state of shock and amazed to still be alive. The car just became a complete monster. I mean, the car was in charge of us. We had no control. I mean, that was like something... That was the end of our lives. Felicity Beck had no idea that two months earlier, another couple also had a terrifying experience in the same model of car. We'd had a lovely day in London with our new granddaughter, who was about four weeks old, and uh, we were very relaxed, but wanting to get home before it was too late because a long drive home. Derek and Pat Rushton bought their car in January 97, only days after it was launched in Britain. It was a Ford Explorer. They'd only had it two weeks. He kept saying, it won't stop, it won't stop, it won't stop. And I watched him going through all the motions, and I just sat there and watched him. I took my foot off the accelerator, and nothing happened. The engine just carried on going as, as if my foot was there. So I put brakes on, and the car slowed a little bit, but it didn't reduce Stop. the engine noise and didn't really bring the speed down. 
I began to think, what am I going to do? The traffic was heavy. We were in the uh, centre lane of three lanes of traffic and I could see there was a hard shoulder, so decided I'd bulldoze my way, to, way across. Uh, I switched the engine off when we were going about 40 miles an hour and the car stopped amid clouds and clouds of smoke. An RAC man couldn't find anything wrong with the Explorer, so they drove home very, very slowly. Derek wrote to Ford, spelling out exactly what happened. Ford said it was likely an object caused the throttle to jam, but it had to happen again before they'd replace the car. Three times Derek wrote to them with the same warning. It would be um, no solace to my wife or myself should one of us die, be severely injured or prosecuted following a repeat occurrence, to know that then Ford would be willing to swap the vehicle. They finished up by saying that they hoped our future motoring would be enjoyable and trouble-free. The impression we got was that Ford did not think there was anything seriously wrong at all. Felicity Beck didn't know any of that when she complained to Ford two months later. Ford told her they believed the carpet was caught beneath the accelerator pedal. It was miraculous that we were still alive and that was my thought that it, if, if it happened to us it could happen to someone else. Did you get a sense from Ford as to whether this had, had happened to anyone else or whether you were the only people? Oh, very much that it certainly hadn't happened to anyone else and we were the only people with a problem. But Ford knew otherwise. Over the next year, there was a steady stream of complaints. In June 97, Ford alerted its dealers, but still didn't tell its customers. There were 27 uh, customer complaints, but it wasn't a question of us not doing anything. In fact, we were conducting a major investigation. We had already written to dealers to ensure that the mats were completely put into place. The first complaints only came through to my, to my recollection about the middle of 97. No, people were complaining within weeks of the car being launched in Britain. But there were incidents in January 97, March 97, April 97, October 97, late 97, January 98, then April 98. We had the complaints initially about February 97. The car was launched at the end of, of 96. Once we, look, once we got the complaints, we put our engineering team to work to try and understand what the root cause was. The last thing we want to do is to conclude that we have a cause which isn't the cause, think we solved the problem, then find we haven't.